Hello. Um, this is going to be a bit of a walkthrough of my views around preparing students for paper two of the Environmental Systems and Societies course. Um, it's a personal view. It's very, very much based on what I suggest in the classroom, but it's my view of it. It's, this is not an official IEB view, and that's very, very important. Also, I'm going to use the data very, very much based on uh, the assessments before 2019, because in 2019 and before, um, currently the final analysis, etc., of 2023 has not been completed. So I don't want to include that data, but it'll, it'll run very, very similarly. So, first question we've got to really ask ourselves is, what's the purpose of paper two? What is paper two actually doing? Um, paper two causes quite a few bits of, quite a few problems for educators, obviously. There's a lot of questions about it. So to think about that, let's first of all think about where we sit in terms of environmental systems compared to uh, biology, yeah? So, if we compare the distribution of grades from biology compared to um, ESS, and in particular SL biology, there's not a massive, massive difference, yeah? There isn't a great big difference in the grade distribution. So, students electing to, um, to take environmental systems in the May exam session tend to be very, very similar to students electing to take biology. In, and the grade distribution is very, very similar. Yeah, Certain years, obviously, biology does better in some areas. Other years, environmental systems does better. That's just the nature of the beast. But one thing to take into account is that uh, there are many fewer students undertaking environmental systems. Um, there is no real statistical significance between any of the grade boundaries. I did a quick thing that you see the confidence interval is 0 0.96. So um, they, there's not really a big difference. There's not really a difference between any of these grades. Yeah. So let's now jump into mark distribution. So paper two obviously is made up of 64 marks. And generally... This is general, it's not entirely there, that we can see that somewhere around about 55% of AO3 marks obviously are available on the paper. That's, that's regular, year to year, that's round about regular. That doesn't change very, very much. Yeah. But to get those marks, well, if you look at, at, the, at the, where the marks are coming from, from AO3, they're really coming from the seven and nine mark questions. Yeah, the majority of marks are actually coming from the seven and nine mark questions. They're making the biggest bulk of marks available. So they're, they're very important marks. Yeah, let's take that a bit further. So total number of questions that were asked was 20, but the number of AO3 questions that were actually asked were five, so a quarter of all questions are asking AO3, but they're providing 55% of all the marks available, okay? So, let's have a look at the grade boundaries. Well, all the AO3 marks, well, the grade boundaries, if you look for a six, the grade boundary for a six and an eight, you'll see that That 36, the number of marks available from AO3, fits in a level 6. And if we go back to the descriptors of performance, in old IB language, before a change in 2015, that was described as very, very good performance. So the final two questions in each of these structured essays on paper two are really focusing the students on higher order thinking, on critical skills. And they are the questions that really get students six and seven. If a student just answered those and nothing else, yeah, those questions and nothing else, they would get 33 marks on that paper and they would have got a six. 
They could have left the rest of the paper alone and not got anything else. That's showing you the focus of where these questions are. They are not meant to be easy questions. They're meant to be accessible, but they are not meant for every student to get the maximum mark on them. Uh, and that seems counterintuitive to all the things we think about, because obviously we want to try and get the highest mark for all students, but we've got to be honest and, and accept that not all students are going to get sixes and sevens. Yeah, And if we go back to um, the grade distribution, yeah, so if we go back to the grade distribution, well, as we can see that generally only round of you know, the small percentage less than 15 percent of students get a six or a seven that's not a big number that's not a big number so so we should be looking generally so if we have a class of 100 students about 15 of them might get six or a seven yeah so let's take that back to where we just were okay so and let's sort of summarize that a little bit yeah. If you only answered AO1 and AO2 questions, you could only possibly get a four. You couldn't get higher than a four, really. You've got to answer these AO3 questions. Yeah. Yeah, because the AO3 questions are really the ones describing performance at above a five. And that's sort of borne out. So let's have a look at the two papers together. Okay, so paper one, 35 marks. Paper two, 65 marks, total of 100 marks. But the total marks that come from the seven and nine point questions are 32. So 32 of all the marks available are coming from these two from these two questions yeah so i think the first thing we've got to ask ourselves in the classroom is do we spend enough time assessing ao3 and it's something to think about for yourselves what percentage of questions do you ask that are just short answer do we ask students enough essay style questions if they are so important yeah it's something to really really think about and i'm going to try and reframe that in another in, an, in another way so if we look at this, if we compare to Bloom's taxonomy, well, when we're talking about AO3, we're talking about command terms of evaluate, justify, and synthesize, which is the, the top end of Bloom's taxonomy, creating, yeah? Evaluating and creating. So we're expecting students to be able to do and undertake quite complex processes and to be able to actually present their answers in what is really an argumentative form, they must evaluate, they must be able to justify, and at the very, very top of it, they must be able to synthesize if they're gonna get sixes and sevens. And we can see that here, that sort of, that's the way that it fits in, in terms of that. Now, how does that affect students who are not, maybe not gonna get sixes and sevens? Well, obviously, if we're aiming to evaluate, evaluate must contain an explanation. And an explanation must contain a description. And descriptions contain outlines. And outlines usually contain a definition. Yeah. Do we really need to ask state questions ever if evaluation questions must contain state in it? Yeah. So... If we're aiming to evaluate eventually, my argument would be that we spend more time on questions that evaluate and much less time on questions that get students just to state or even define. Yeah? Those are very, very simple process questions. They're regurgitated. Those they can do for homework. Yeah? But in class, we really need to get them concentrating on evaluations. And I find it a bit, and so it becomes a bit reduc reductionist. Quite often when I see assessments that my teachers have made quite often they, the, 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 the the assessments are, re, are reductivist yeah they're the reduction yeah? there's more focus on state and define than there is on evaluate and i think that could be problematic so what i suggest is is that we spend much more time on evaluate that we're aiming to ask as many evaluate questions 
And if we look in terms of the response, yeah, for the number of marks available. So as we can see, what we're really asking them for from the seven to nine mark band is a pretty sophisticated answer, yeah? Substantial evidence, a wide breadth of knowledge. They're effectively linked to each other, consistent, appropriate use of terminology, effective use of well-explained examples, thoughtful, well-balanced, insightful analysis, explicit judgments and conclusions. So we're really, really asking them to evaluate information. That often presents itself as problematic. Where do these AO3 questions come from? Yeah. <clears throat> and so one of the things I think is a little bit of shift in focus. Yeah. How do we get to produce these AO3 questions? So generally when we plan a curriculum, we tend to follow a paradigm a little bit like this, where we're, we've got a sequence and we've got a scope and we're trying to teach the material along the way and hit the depth of it that we need to hit. Yeah. It's very, very two dimensional. Yeah. However, I think in environmental systems, we've got a third dimension is the connections. And we've really, really, really got to keep on sort of pulling out those connections that are in there. Okay, so let's have a look at this in practice. And we're going to look at the May 2019 6C. Even though there is growing global support for ecocentric values, the global composition consumption of fossil fuels continues to rise each year. With reference to energy choices in named countries, discuss possible reasons for this situation occurring. So, where does that question come from? So, let's have a look. So, obviously, it comes from energy choices. And the applications and skills says, yeah, Evaluate the advantages, disadvantages, discuss factors that affect the choice of energy sources by a different society. Yeah. So what we've got, we've got choice and we've got possible reasons. Okay. That's coming straight out of the guide. It's coming straight out of an application. That question is coming really, really straight out of there. Okay. And if we go back to the knowledge and understanding, well, within that knowledge and understanding, fossil fuels contribute to the majority. Yeah, it's, it's in there. Yeah, the, the, the information, the knowledge that the, the students need to know. And if you look at the mark scheme for that year, you'll see that some of those, some of those knowledge and understandings are basically repeated in the mark scheme. Yeah, the guide tells you to teach it. It's telling you directly to teach it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm mentioning the mark scheme. Yeah. So... Again, it's grounding it very, very much directly in it. So by sort of focusing on the knowledge on its own, we're not really, really doing justice to the teaching of it. What we've really got to be focusing on is the application and skills. Yeah, we've really got to be focusing on the application and skills. And if we're focusing on getting the students to complete every one of those application and skills and thinking about what that means. Discuss. Discuss is a high order. So there's quite a lot that we, we can be doing in the classroom. Yeah. So, oh, and importantly here, topic one is in every other topic. So if we're teaching topic one separately and then never coming back to it, why are those choices being made? What might be the reason? Well, so many questions come from EVS. Let's have a look at another one from May 21. Now, obviously, this paper wasn't asked because the, the, the examination didn't run, but the paper was discuss the role of feedback mechanisms in maintaining the stability and promoting and restoring of plant communities threatened by human impacts. So. Where's that coming from? Well, it's coming from energy and equilibria, and it's coming from biomes of nations and succession. Okay? So we're already having to synthesize, students are already going to synthesize different parts of the guide. And but which of the applications is it coming from? So again, let's let's just sort of 
zoom in a little bit more. So these are the applications. Yeah, discuss the role of feedback mechanisms, stability, promote and restore in plant communities threatened by human impacts. Well, we can see very, very quickly that discuss the factors that could lead to alternative stable states. Discuss the link between ecosystem stability, success and diversity and human activity. Yeah. Again, the guidance is given to us. Yeah. And again, the guidance is given to us there. Very, very much so. Yeah. And obviously, we've got to look at the role of feedback systems. So we're talking about energy and equilibria. So it's pulling it all together. Yeah. Um, as a final example, I'm going to have a look at another May 2019. Climate can both influence and be influenced by terrestrial food production. To what extent can terrestrial food production strategies contribute to a, a sustainable equilibrium in this relationship? So what we really need to be getting the students to do is actually be able to pull out information from that. So terrestrial food production systems we have, yeah, which is coming from 5.2. Evaluate strategies to increase sustainable or terrestrial in, sustainability in terrestrial food production. And in 7.3, discuss mitigation and adaptation strategies to deal with the impacts of climate. Yeah. And in 7.2, we've got discuss the feedback mechanisms. So immediately we're pulling out bits from all over the place. And if we break this down, yeah, in terms of what the answer may include, yeah, we start getting a picture of what students need to be doing in terms of answering these questions. Yeah. Um, if you start looking through the guide and actually starting to pull together all the bits and pieces, you can start then sort of producing nine mark type questions so in this one in this one that i've done this is about sustainability the question asks and it's, it's it's a task as a group i've given this one as a group task and i've used some information from um actually using paper two structured essay questions yeah and we've taken it in there so they have to look at sustainability and I've got one for using an IA that actually looks at some of the uh, criteria from the uh, extended essay as well, which again is putting it there. So um, think about the construction. I'm going to leave this with thought. Yeah, where where do we construct this from? You know, the construction of those questions. Okay, thanks a lot. Hopefully that was quite. Hopefully that was useful.